Thank you, CJ. So last week, we talked about our covenant to each other um, that we make at the baptisms of our children and in receiving members into the church to nurture one another in the Christian faith and life. This is a promise that goes through good times and rougher times as we figure out this life together, as we respond to things that happen from the outside to us, or we respond to conflict from within our family. Although, you know, visitors, there's no conflict here in our family. We're unlike any other human in the world. We got this. So part of this is our faith journey. And this is a journey that our ancestors have been walking together long before we were born. And our children will be walking long after we are gone. But what is our calling for the time we are given right now? And as we look at how we make this journey together and how we respond in faith and how we grow in faith together, we turn to the scriptures today. Um, We've got both scriptures, one that deals with what happens when there's a natural disaster, something way bigger than our church family here that affects us and many others, and then what happens within our own church family, and how do we respond to each? So the part of the um, story of Joel, we don't know when this book was written, but we know why it was written. So the first chapter before our reading today is all about, and look it up sometime because the language is awesome, the metaphors, and the, it's so vivid. Um, but it's all about this plague of locusts that has come, and it's this incredible crisis, right? Because everything's going fine. This is an agricultural-based community, but, you know, the crops are doing well, and they're taking care, and they're making it. And then all of a sudden, this army of locusts just descends and wipes out everything. So in a matter of a split second, they go from life is normal, everything fine, to complete and utter devastation and disaster and despair. Because how do you come back from this? There's no food. And enter the prophet Joel. And so he owns what happens. He owns that swarm and that plague of locusts. But he also owns a promise that that is not the last chapter. That there is a God who will not let death be the last word. But who will bring about abundance and richness. Now, um, Judy and Rob, are you able to bring the Joel passage back up for us to look at? Awesome. Thanks. Because here's here's the one thing that we need to look at in this scripture that's different from the ancient um, culture then compared to now. And the next screen. Okay, so it says that, you know, great swarming locusts, right? That hopper, that destroyer, the cutter, my great army, which I sent against you. Now, for us reading that, That's a whole host of issues in and of itself. Flag that, set that aside, come back a few thousand years with me to a society that is built on honor and shame in which monotheism isn't a common thing. There are all kinds of different peoples, all with their own gods. And if there's a swarm of locusts that come, some outside phenomenon that we can't explain, that means the gods are at work. And if your god is at work, but yet you get wiped out, what does that mean? Your god ain't what you think it is, right? Like the god you're worshiping is not going to hold his water with everybody else and all the other gods. So that means you are shamed, but more importantly, your God is shamed. And now you don't have a foundation to stand on around others and around your neighbors, and there's a huge crisis. So when Joel says, I sent them against you, that it was God who sent the locust, that's actually for them good news. That's a part of the hope of what Joel is sharing Because it means that God is at work and is in control. 
and that even though God brought about this devastation, God's going to bring about even greater abundance, which means even greater honor, and if we're going to talk about it in human terms, even greater bragging rights around our neighbors. So this isn't the same dilemma that we face in reading it from our context today. This is actually a word of hope. And so that's a perfect transition like into, see, I've done this, but also there's going to be plenty and there's going to be wondrous dealings with you so that my people will never again be put to shame. Everyone's going to know the power of our God and the way that our God provides. And so there's this deep inhale, like we practice in our prayer, of I can love others. Because let's be honest, sometimes it's really hard to love other people. I can deal with the locusts that are coming. And then Joel gives us our anchor. Because God loves me. Because of the name of the Lord our God. Because there is no other. We get extra space because of who we are anchored in our covenant with God. Now, I'm calling Karen out because we've got a personal trainer in our midst. If we look at this in the physical world, this fits perfectly. And Karen can say this better than I. But for whatever little bit of training I've gone through, I know that I do my heavy lifting, my heavy presses or squats when I'm exhaling. Because that's where the power is. And I want us to bring that physical truth into our spiritual truths as well. Like as we inhale, we're able to do more because of the exhale that's our anchor. Like because of that, that gives us our power to lift or to take on something that's heavy and that's hard. And here's the beautiful thing. Joel just doesn't say like, happy lifting, you have the power to do it. Joel says, you're going to know how to do it. So Karen, you're going to be out of a job at some time because at some point... We're not going to need a personal trainer or a personal prophet to come and tell us how to do this because we're all going to have the visions. Every single person, old and young, male and female, slave and free. That was a really big deal for this time period. Every single human is going to have the vision and going to have the dream and going to know where to push or where to do our heavy lifting because the Holy Spirit will give us that insight and will give us that clarity and will give us that direction. And so as we are in covenant with one another, we can be in covenant and we can do what is difficult and maybe even impossible because of the anchor that we have in God. And because of the power and the clarity that God gives us and the Holy Spirit to know where to put our power. We had a really hard conversation on Tuesday about what we need from God and from one another and what we need in worship and what to do when what we need is different from what other people need. Because we all worship and pray in different ways. And we practice today about that inward focus and that quiet time and that stillness, which is incredibly crucial in our world today with all of its busyness and all of its crazy all the time. But we are bodied souls. So we need a little bit of movement with our body too to praise and to open up and to feel the fullness of what it means to just throw your arms out wide and open yourself to all of the power and glory that God has in store for us. And so we're figuring out how to do that together, but we're doing it because we all brought to that conversation on Tuesday an anchor that would hold us to be able to breathe in and hear what other people need, and trust that God will make a way for all of our needs to be met in some way. And not only that, not only the power to come together, but then that spirit vision piece, right? That so what piece, that practice so that we might be for the world what God needs us to be. 
we ended that meeting with communion. And I want to thank you all again because it had gone late. And we didn't um, just go home, but we made time to do a communion liturgy together, to break bread together. And in the words of our honesty in the conversation of that meeting and sharing what we needed from each other, to hear God's words, God's work in that communion liturgy prayer where we ask for God to make us one with God, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. So that we can inhale, we can exhale, and we can be the people full of the purpose of God's covenant and of God's great good news. This happens when we do what we did on Tuesday and we are open. We give God something to work with. I want us to think about this parable that we all know and think about who the Pharisee and who the tax collector was. The tax collector was someone who was stealing from his people who were already occupied by another force so that he could get the power and the economy and that he needed to be able to take care of himself. But it meant that he was taking from what other families needed to take care of themselves. So it for real set up harm and issue. There was a conflict that they were all trapped in of the Roman occupying force and how to live and how to figure that out. The tax collector decided to stay side with the Romans and use their power for his personal gain over and against his people. So when the Pharisee gets up and says, thank God I'm not like that tax collector, there's some legitimacy in that prayer. Thank God I'm not stealing and taking what I want from my fellow families, making it so that they don't have what they need to live and to survive. And it's a prayer that I know that I will own that I have prayed. Like, thank God I know somewhat of some good choices to make and some harm to avoid. But where's the problem? The Pharisee's prayer didn't leave God any room to work. Yes, the Pharisee was giving all of who he was to follow religion, to keep the Jewish faith and identity alive, and was giving all that he had, time and finances and everything. If you make a checklist and check it off, he was the perfect faithful follower. But hear the echo of Paul's letter. But if I have not love, I am nothing. The Pharisee didn't ask for anything. The Pharisee depended only on himself. And he was doing a lot and it was good work. Do not get me wrong. But it was all from him. There was no room for God to be at work. His prayer was, thank you, God, that I am not like. And that was it. The prayer of the tax collector, Lord, have mercy on me. The tax collector asked for something. And because he asked, God could give. So our call, as we go in this covenant life together, as we figure out how to be faithful when crisis comes, is to keep our anchor and to know where our power comes from, to pray for the Spirit's direction as to where the next faithful step will be, but our resiliency comes when we take on the tax collector's prayer, when we own the harm that we have done, even when we do everything we can to not do harm, when we are the good people doing the good fight and something bad happens, and we throw our hands up in the air, God, how could you? 
But like the prophet Joel, who did a theological shift for his people in saying that God caused this plague, I ask for us to make the same shift today for resiliency's sake so that we can fulfill our covenant promise that I don't believe God causes conflict, but I do believe God uses it. And when God uses it and works through us, we can make a change and be more open to the Holy Spirit's power and the direction that the Spirit has for us than we ever could have beforehand. Because let's be honest, there's enough going along in the world and we don't have any pressure to change. I'm not going to. And so conflict gives us an opportunity that doesn't come around otherwise. So in our covenant life together, let's do this together. Let's breathe in and let's exhale, anchoring ourselves in the power of who our God is and what our God has done and what our God will do. And then from that anchor, let's throw our arms wide open to the spirit that will pour out on us for visions and for dreams. And let's go. Let's go with it and do it. And then when everything crumbles, because it will, Let's not retreat in tears and failings. Well, let's step in and be like, all right, we got another gift. We got another opportunity. And then again, we anchor ourselves. And again, we throw our arms wide open. And again, we have a revelation. And again, we go. And that is the journey I pledge to be with you on. And then I'm excited to see where God will lead us. Amen. For this coming week, I ask for us to make a commitment to each other and to figure out where we are on relying on God's power in us, not on ourselves. So in our own prayer life, what are the openings we can intentionally make? What are the things we can intentionally ask for so that the Spirit has space in our lives to respond? Thanks. As we are figuring this out together and as we are committing to each other and that as we are figuring out and loving this Holy Spirit, we've got a hymn when words alone cannot express and the Holy Spirit does some intervening for us and brings it all together. Would you stand and join and sing? This is in the green book. <laughs> 